Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I am going to have a shift in gears quite a bit. Uh, as the last speaker was talking, I was checking our error bars. They're okay. So <laughs> we'll be talking about some technology development and, um, you know, really kind of har hardcore experimental research. And the idea here is to develop new tools uh, for cell sorting, cell handling, cell counting, um, because we think this is a very important area as biotherapeutics increasingly proceed towards the, the clinic, we need the right types of, of quality control technologies that will allow us to, to be able to, with a high level of, of precision, uh, really give the, the community and, and the industry confidence that we're giving the same thing to patients every single time. And this is a little bit different as we move from small molecules where you can use all of the chemical analysis types of, of tools to uh, administering cell-based therapies, right? It's a very different type of, of quality control problem that you're faced with. And so we've been working a bit on trying to develop these, these types of tools um, with an eye towards being able to, to hand the community ways to characterize large batches of, of cells that may be used therapeutically. And I think there's a, a number of reasons for, for doing this, and the number one really is, is safety and the safety of, of cell-based uh, therapeutics. Um, whether they be stem cell based therapies or maybe things like uh, CAR T therapies, it's, it's abundantly clear that we have to carefully explore and document very, uh, their presence or absence of really rare subpopulations of, of cells in these batches of, of therapies. Um, I'll, I'll be talking today mainly about um, cell based therapies and uh, differentiated car cardiomyocytes. But this has also been highlighted in the literature um, through episodes where CAR T cells that contain very low levels of contaminating B cells have been found to be really dangerous to patients. And there's actually been incidences where uh, contamination of B cells in CAR T cell preps uh, have actually killed patients. And so clearly we need to be able to characterize down to the single cell level when we're dealing with, with batches of, of billions of cells. So our approach to this problem, and this is a technology that we developed that actually addresses a, a suite of problems, um, looking at, at rare cells in therapeutic uh, cell batches is just one of them. But this is an approach that we call magnetic ranking cytometry. And in some ways, it's, it's really very analogous to flow cytometry, but using magnetism as a way to look at rare cells rather than fluorescence. So in uh, flow cytometry, you take a fluorescently labeled antibody uh, that's going to bind to a target of interest. You incubate that with your cells. You put the cells through a flow cytometer, and then the flow cytometer basically looks cell by cell, one cell at a time, how much the cells are fluorescing. We have a suite of tools where we instead use magnetically labeled antibodies, and then we design microfluidic devices that allow us to uh, still quantitate the amount of protein expression, but much uh, with much better compatibility with large uh, batch types of, of problems. And so I'll tell you today about a technology that we refer to as cytolocate, where we can look for single cells in a background of billions of non-target cells, and not only can we identify them, but we can also characterize uh, levels of protein expression and RNA expression. And then I thought I would also touch on a, a kind of another iteration of this technology that we think will be useful for uh, therapeutic target discovery eventually, so a slightly different topic, but one I thought I would, would touch on. And this is where we, we take this type of approach, we put it into a non-destructive uh, format, and it allows us to do some interesting things. Uh, with, with doing large-scale screens. But I'll start with uh, this approach that we've developed for looking at or trying to identify undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells uh, in batches of, of cultured cardiomyocytes. And this is a collaboration with Gordon Keller at, at UHN. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Gordon's work that has focused on producing cardiomyocytes from pluripotent stem cells. Uh, with the application uh, being the remuscularization of infarcted regions of the, the heart. And these uh, cells now have been produced uh, in vitro, 
with high levels of efficiency, but there is still some heterogeneity in what comes out the other end of one of these different differentiation protocols. And it's vitally important that we establish with certainty that there are no pluripotent stem cells that remain in these cultures of, of differentiated cells, right? Putting a, a stem cell into a patient um, that's undifferentiated has a, a variety of consequences, and we have to be very uh, careful to, to kind of know if those cells are, are present. So our approach um, is as follows. So we've developed this method that allows us to label uh, the pluripotent stem cells. If they're still present in a culture of cardiomyocytes, uh, we use a specific antibody, again, magnetically labeled. And then we put the, the cell mixture through a microfluidic device. That's the rectangle in the, the middle. This microfluidic device has a variety of capture zones within it. And these little X-shaped structures that are really good at, at capturing magnetically labeled cells. And so we flow the, the solution through the device. If there are two, four, six cells in a, a background of, let's say, a billion uh, differentiated cells, we can capture them. We immunostain them. And then we can generate a, a distribution uh, which tells us about the presence or absence of the cells and also maybe about some of their surface expression properties. And the idea is that this could be a tool that could be used to do quality control on batches of therapeutic cells. So that as you're sending a batch out the door or you have a lot of cells and you're doing QC, um, you have the information on any potential contaminating cells um, so that that information is, is on hand. And so, again, for this cardiomyocyte-focused uh, first proof-of-concept system, we developed uh, an immunostating protocol that allowed us to very sensitively visualize undifferentiated cells in batches of cardiomyocytes. And if you look on the left here, we're just doing spiking experiments where we put in 5, 50, 500, 5,000 cells into a, a billion cardiomyocytes, and uh, we were able to show that we could very sensitively see the cells being present. We started about five cells in a billion because if you go below five, you start to have a lot of sampling uncertainty, and it's difficult to know whether you had four or three or two or one, and so there's just error that comes into the measurement, but we, we can go below five. Uh, it's just more difficult to, to get the statistics. So we can, can certainly do this. This is, is somewhat of a, a straightforward measurement for us. And we've also benchmarked this against existing methods that you might think of employing to, to do this. And flow cytometry is really considered to, to be the gold standard for this. Um, this set of charts shows you the, the problem with this in that uh, flow cytometry at very low cell counts, especially with a, a large background of non-target cells, gives you an offset so that at the, the low cell uh, percentages where we're spiking in stem cells into cardiomyocytes, you can see there's an offset there that gives you a false positive. So you really can't go down to those very low cell counts uh, using flow cytometry, whereas if you look at the chart all the way on the right, this is our magnetic ranking cytometry data, and you see we have really good linearity all the way down uh, to the, the low levels here. We also benchmark uh, against digital RT-PCR just to um, also take a look at how that method performed. That's also a difficult um, type of, of measurement to do. You can't do it just off of the DNA, right, because the DNA for the pluripotent stem cells versus the cardiomyocytes is, is basically exactly the same. You can think of going off of, of transcripts. Um, but because of the, the very low levels of the cells that you're looking for versus the background, it's really difficult to, to use PCR-based approaches for this. And so, uh, again, this is a collaborative effort with, with Gordon, and um, we decided that we should really uh, go back to really a, the gold standard type of experiment for looking at whether any of this actually matters. Um, to do uh, teratoma formation uh, experiments in animals to show that this level of undifferentiated cells that we can pick up on in differentiated card cardiomyocytes is actually relevant. So if you have, you know, five cells in a prep of cardiomyocytes, does that really matter? And of course, we only have the answer here for a mouse, and in a mouse it does matter. So when you go down to these low levels of pluripotent cells, cells being present, 
uh, and we do the xenograft experiments, then you can certainly see those, those teratomas uh, coming up in these animals. And so, uh, again, whether this is relevant for human patients, that's, that's an experiment that, that we haven't done and probably it is beyond our capabilities, um, but at least we've, we've shown the relevance of that here. So again, this is a, a technique that we think has a lot of, of promise for manufacturing in the cell therapy space, again, as a, a quality control measure. Um, it's much more sensitive than flow cytometry and qPCR. Uh, I mean, you could think of, of using uh, the animal type studies to do your QC, but that's a very long experiment. We don't want to use animals for that purpose anyway. But in any event, this is, is really, uh, I think, a very practical solution. Uh, it's also a good fit for GMP, uh, GMP type environment. It's a small disposable device. Um, the devices can be archived. You know, the, the data really gives you that single cell level uh, resolution. And so um, we, we think this is, is going to be a, a powerful tool going forward. And it is very scalable. So our microfluidic devices, uh, we make them in the lab now, but we're about to move over to injection molding in terms of a production process. That gives us the ability to make thousands of devices at a time. Uh, and these devices can be validated. You can take a lot of, of 1,000 or 10,000 devices and do all of the quality control needed on those devices so that you have uh, the needed level of certainty about the measurements that are being made. So again, we think this is a, a good fit uh, with, with cell therapy manufacturing. And so with that, um, I'm going to tell you about a different way that we've been using a similar type of approach, but for a, a completely different um, application. And uh, this is, so I'm going to be shifting gears from this uh, approach on the left-hand side, where we basically take our cells, we put them through a device, immunostay, and visualize. Um, instead, what we're going to be doing here is taking the cells, doing the same type of magnetic labeling, but then putting them through a device that does sorting using a different type of mechanism. We call this prismatic deflection because they, the cells basically pass over a set of magnets that then cause them to deflect and sort based on expression levels. Um, but it's non-destructive, so we can collect the cells afterwards. And this opens up uh, a series of, of other uh, applications that, that we think are, are quite interesting and potentially relevant for the discovery of, of new therapeutic targets. And where we're applying this is in uh, providing a tool for phenotypic CRISPR screening. So many of you are probably familiar uh, with the idea that you can really interrogate the entire human genome these days by using CRISPR-Cas9 editing. And so you send in a library of guide RNAs into a, a, se a set of cells. The guide RNAs then knock out one gene per cell, and then you have this collection of cells with individual gene knockouts. Usually to assess then which, oops, which uh, genes are important, let's say for cellular viability or survival, let's say under certain set of stress conditions, you take the cells and you just look at which cells uh, survived, which cells died, you sequence the cells, and then you back out the information about uh, essential or viability-related genes. Um, what's even more powerful, though, is if you can do the same type of analysis, but look for a phenotypic change in your cells. So rather than live dead, ask a question like, is, a, is protein expression going up or down? Are these cells secreting more of something that, that may be important? Um, and so you can start to think about doing these screens, but getting a lot more information content out. But one of the challenges is you need to take your billion cells where you've done your CRISPR knockout, and you need to somehow figure out which ones are upregulating protein expression or downregulating protein expression, or giving you that change in phenotype that may be meaningful. And you can do this using facts. So you can use a fluorescently labeled antibody, throw that in with your CRISPR edited cells, and then uh, have the fax machine, again, sort one by one your billion cells. But that's going to take you a couple weeks, basically, on a fax machine. And if you're at an academic research center, you're going to call up your fax facility and say, hey, can I take over for two weeks? They're going to say, no, 
<laughs> because we have a lot of other people that need to use that machine, you know, but we have time for you three months from now. So, you know, get your screen ready and we'll, we'll see you in three months. So this type of screen is, it's really difficult to do, even in an industry where maybe you might be able to, to buy, let's say, uh, three fax machines and put them side by side and run them 24-7. Um, it's still a, just a, a really difficult type of, of screen to implement. So we teamed up uh, with Jason Moffitt, who's uh, also the University of Toronto, uh, one of our leaders in functional genomics. He was actually the one who brought this problem to our attention and said, hey, can you design a device where we don't have to use facts then to, to process our CRISPR screen, but maybe you could instead really quickly just pull off the cells that are doing something interesting. And so we developed the, the device that's shown here. So on the right-hand side, this is a sketch of the device. And again, we have these deflection guides. And basically what happens is we run the billion cells across the guides. And if there are ones that have had an uptick in expression, they basically run along a different guide in the device because they have lots of magnetic nanoparticles on their surfaces. And then eventually they drop into a, a channel where we can collect them. So we can basically siphon off the cells from the screen that are doing something really interesting. Um, but instead of doing that in two weeks in a fax facility, we can do that in an hour. And we can parallelize this because these are really scalable devices and we can do 10 screens at a time. So we can look at 10 targets or 10 cell lines and just kind of go and go and go in terms of the complexity of the types of screens that we can do. So this is something that um, we think has a lot of applications. It's compatible with uh, fragile cell types. So there's some types of cells that you simply can't put through a fax machine. I mean, fax or flow cytometry was originally designed to, to look at blood cells. It's not that compatible with, with fragile cell types, but this is a really gentle type of, of measurement that um, you can really basically put any cell into this device and, and there aren't issues with viability. So um, we just had our first paper on this come out uh, just on Monday, and uh, this was, was very exciting um, to, to finally get this, this work published. And the proof of concept system that we worked with on this, in this first publication was looking at CD47, which has been identified as a potential target for immunotherapy. It's one of those markers that tumor cells um, tend to upregulate to evade the immune system. So CD47 is, is thought of as a don't eat me signal in that if it's expressed on the surface of a tumor cell, macrophages that are looking for cells that maybe shouldn't be there and, and be degraded or disposed of, if it sees CD47, it won't attack or engulf the cell. And so that, that's why it's a don't eat me signal. And, the idea is that if you could turn down levels of CD47 expression, you might be able to kind of reinvigorate that interaction with the immune system. So we then did our screen to look for genetic modulators of CD47 expression. There's a, quite a few companies out there and a, quite a few active clinical trials where people are uh, trying to directly drug CD47, so bind an antibody to the uh, surface protein and then try to, to in, interfere with its activity that way. But what we thought is maybe we can come in and find genetic uh, regulators of the expression of this protein and, and maybe go after drugging it a different way. So we used our microfluidic technology, we did the screen, we got our results, and this is actually always the hard part. When you do these screens and the, you know, the data looks amazing, except then you look at it and you have no idea what it means, right? So we got our data, and the top two hits, there's, uh, or two out of the top three hits, one was CD47, because um, as we sequence the guides, right, we should be seeing the guides that correspond to CD47, because that's going to knock down the expression level. Um, but we also came up with this protein called QPCTL, and I'm a chemist by training, and I, like, I find this kind of biology, to me, it's like alphabet soup, right? It's just all these three, four um, letter, uh, five letter abbreviations. So ours was, was QPCTL that was at the top of our, our list. Um, but when we looked at this enzyme, um, it's, it's an interesting um, intracellular en enzyme that uh, cyclizes uh, the glutamine amino acid within protein sequences. It wasn't immediately uh, obvious to, to us what that would have to do with CD47 levels expression or what it was doing on the cell surface. But when we looked at the crystal structure of CD47, it became obvious pretty quickly. And then if you look at the crystal structure at the end terminus, there's a cyclized glutamine residue. 
And so we thought, okay, well, something's going on there with that and terminal residue. And we thought this was really intriguing because when you look at the interface of CD47 and SERP alpha, that end terminal residue is right there in the binding pocket. So we thought, okay, we have this hit and, and it's, it's probably really important for um, how CD47 contributes to immune evasion. So we did lots of follow-up experiments that I, I, I won't take you through today, but we were able to show that QPCTL installs this essential modification at the end terminus of CD47 and then if you knock down QPCTL or if you have a chemical inhibitor of QPCTL, you then take down the levels of modified CD47 on the cell surface. And so you can basically turn off that interaction with SERP alpha coming in through this other modulator, coming in through an interaction with QPCTL. So what this showed us is that this type of, of approach, this is really a way that we can go in and start to mine the genome for new drug targets, you know, new ways of, of going after um, proteins that may affect how tumor cells interact with the immune system, as well as other types of, of activities. And so uh, we're now launching a, a large scale effort where we're building uh, a big platform around this technology because we have lots of different types of assays that we can do. So we can look for expression, we can look for protein modification, we can look for protein secretion. Um, and again, we can do large scale screens. We can do CRISPR knockout, we can do CRISPR activation, we can do multiplex screens. And so what we're gearing up to do, and some of this is already in progress, are large screens that you would never take on by fax, or let's say you're looking at 10 closely related targets, you're looking in 10 different cell lines, and then you're layering on these different types of, of CRISPR screens, so that around a given target, we can build up a huge amount of data that tells us how to go after that target. And we think this will be particularly uh, powerful for many of the targets that people consider undruggable, right? They don't have a good binding pocket. It's been really hard to get a small molecule in there to develop as a drug. Well, maybe we can fun, find underlying modulators that will help us go after those as therapeutic targets. And so we're, we're building this out, and then uh, we refer to this as, as Pegasus, uh, which is phenotypic genome-wide screening at scale. Um, and we're getting quite a bit of, of industry uh, interest in this, interest from uh, different pharma companies that, that want to take their favorite targets and plug them through this platform. And so we're really excited about where we can take this. And then we're also teaming up uh, with folks that have antibody and also small molecule screening platforms so that we can quickly go from this interrogation of different targets over to generating potential therapeutic leads. So with that, um, I've told you about these two applications where magnetic labeling of, of cells uh, can give you different types of, of information that we think uh, can be quite informative. And we're applying both of these types of, of technologies quite broadly. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that we are actively looking for team members, especially on this Pegasus project that I just told you about. That's something that we're, we're scaling up pretty quickly. And so graduate students, postdocs, research associates, we're looking at people for at really at all levels to help us drive that forward. So with that, I want to thank everybody who is involved uh, with this work. Again, Gordon Keller uh, and Mark from Gordon's group, uh, Jason Moffat on the functional genomic side, Stefan Auger, also, uh, who's in the Faculty of Pharmacy. I thank everyone in the, the picture here. This is my, my research group. Uh, I really want to thank Medicine by Design because uh, we, we've been funded by Medicine by Design from the, the beginning. I had never worked in regenerative medicine before Medicine by Design came to be. And through having that support, it has pulled us in all of these di interesting directions where we can take high-performance analytical technologies and apply them to new problems and also by being part of the Medicine by Design community, that's where actually all of these ideas came from. So the things that we were funded to do by Medicine by Design 
there was no collaboration with Gordon Keller in there. There wasn't a collaboration with Stefan Ajay or Jason Moffat in our funded projects. But just by being part of the community, maybe doing a little bootstrapping here and there to, to some of our stuff that was funded, all of the work that I just told you about came about because of the interactions and, and because of our involvement in the, the community that Medicine by Design has created. So I, I can't say enough about how important that initiative has been to many of us uh, in the Toronto ecosystem. So with that, I'll end and, and take your questions. Thank you.